right, good morning. Shabbat Shalom. Glad to have everybody here. Um, I'm not sure if I gave a similar message to this here over the past years or not. I was called back this week to a message I gave. I know that I gave this message a few years ago somewhere else, uh, similar to this anyway. I've, I've expounded and added to it, but uh, I was drawn to this message this week <clears throat> as I was going through something in my, in my personal life where I viewed something that I thought would be good. I viewed something that I thought I needed in my life. I viewed something as I thought moving forward was something that needed to come to pass. And God showed me that he viewed it differently. And so I was brought back to this message and I kind of wanted to share some of it with you as well. Um, there was something I said uh, years ago. I used to say uh, something along the lines of the Bible is so simple, even a child can understand it. I used to say this all the time. Well, I, I don't say that anymore because the Bible is not so simple that even a child can understand it. All right. Do I think that children can understand concepts of the Bible? Absolutely, they can understand some things. But do I think that my five-year-old can understand the complexities of the story of Jephthah when he has to offer his daughter as a sacrifice? No. Do I think that my two-year-old can understand the complexities of the creation story as God speaks things into existence? No. Do I think that my nine-year-old even can understand and fully grasp God's covenant relationship with his people when relayed to us in his Bible as a marriage? No, I don't. The Bible is a very complex thing, and it was given to us with that understanding Built into the scriptures, excuse me. Built into the scriptures themselves is the very fact that children would ask us questions. We just had Passover not too long ago, and during our Passover seder, we asked some traditional questions. But the concept of those questions comes from a biblical passage that says, "Every year at this time of year, the the the, the questions will arise from children saying, why do we do these things?'" The Bible itself tells us that children will ask us questions. Just this week, we got uh, all of our children new Bibles. We kind of updated their Bibles. Some are getting older and they, they needed, you know, fuller, real Bibles. Um, some are just getting to the age of like Malachi. He's got his first little picture Bible, which is the Bible in terms that he can understand, right? A picture Bible for, for his age. But my oldest daughter, Mariah, she came to me just the other day because she got her new Bible in the mail. She's all excited. She starts reading it, and she says, Daddy, I got a question. I said, what is that? Here in Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, Let us make man in our image. Why does God say, let us make man in our image? I said, baby, you are opening a whole can of worms. And I spent the next 10 or 15 minutes trying to explain to her the complexities of that one single verse. And she walked away, and whether it was my inability to convey a message appropriately to a nine-year-old or the mere fact that a nine-year-old just can't quite grasp that concept yet, she still didn't quite understand it as she moved forward. So today I want to talk about some things that need sifting through to understand in our Bibles. There's mountains of metaphors, and by the end of the message I want to come to the metaphors of mountains. But there's mountains of metaphors. One of my favorite things in the Bible are metaphors. Language that's used to relay a message in a certain way. I have a friend of mine, Daniel Binkley, and... Uh, he and I have been friends a long time. Uh, years ago, we butted head, uh, heads over theological issues, and today we come together at least twice a week, if not more, and talk about the Bible. And, but we have a running joke with us and, and other people around us about metaphors. A while back, we were talking about the Bible, and he, he looks up and he just says, Matt, you just think the whole Bible is a metaphor, don't you? And I said, well, 
kind of, yeah. <laughs> and so I said, you think the whole thing's literal? And he said, absolutely. I said, well, I think there's literal metaphors in the Bible. So now we have this run joke where I'll bring something up, and he asks, is that a metaphor or literal, Matt? But I want to talk about metaphors and what they are. The oldest uh, definition that we have in history comes from Aristotle. He says the application of a word that belongs to another thing, either genus, species, species of genus, or by analogy. Aristotle was defining this word. It's the oldest definition we have. It's not the oldest use of the word. It doesn't come from Greek, uh, Greek uh, philosophy. It's just the oldest definition we have. But the use of metaphor and language well outdates this. Aristotle would come to the conclusion that metaphors were simply useless. Why do we need to exchange one word for another to relay a message? Just say it. So I disagree with where Aristotle left, left off, but um, that, that kind of gets us a starting point. The Oxford Dictionary says it's a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. That's pretty good. Webster's similar, a figure of speech in which a... Oh, that's the same one. Uh, they copied off each other, apparently. Um, Webster said, a figure of speech in which a word or phrase literally denoting one kind of an object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a likeness or analogy between them, as in drowning in money. We're getting a little closer there. I like, there's a guy who writes on language and, and literature, if I can remember his name, Max Black, I think. He uses man as a wolf as a metaphor to kind of explore and, and, and conceptualize this idea of metaphor. And his whole idea is that a metaphor is not one single thing that transcends all metaphors that have to do with that, that particular phrase. If we say a man is a wolf, a man is a wolf. There's so many directions you can go with that. We could say that that man is actually hungry like a wolf. That's a, a whole different metaphor that we have surrounding that animal. But are we talking about the man is so hungry, he's famished, he's, he's hungry as a wolf? Are we talking about a cunning nature? We think of uh, little kids' story tales where a wolf is cunning and hides himself and so are we saying that man is cunning like a wolf? Wolves are wild animals. They're ravenous. They tear things to shreds when they go and eat. Are we referring to man in this metaphor as a ravenous creature? And inherently in it, when we use wolf as a metaphor for man, the reverse also becomes a little more accessible where we see wolves more human-like. So using this as a metaphor, we can go one of these ways, or you could actually very beautifully intertwine all of these into one big metaphor about mankind being related to a wolf. That's how metaphors are used. It's not just one single meaning or one single idea that has to come to mind. Here are a few of our metaphors um, in our, in our nature, in our uh, world today. Life is a journey. What does that mean? What does life as a journey mean? We say it all the time. The first thing that comes to mind is just like, I'm on a trip, you know, like it's a journey and you're going to see different places. You're going to, well, like my journey might be roses and butterflies, but Seth's journey might be, you know, running through the, the I don't know, a bad journey, right? <laughs> I was trying to think of something that was appropriate. Seth might be, ha his, his view of what a journey is, he may not have had great vacations or he may not have had uh, Sunday drives with his grandmother around the countryside, right? When I say life is a journey, Seth may think, I've never had a good journey. Every time I've set out and left my house, it's been a horrible thing. So the metaphor life is a journey could mean something else. You are my sunshine. What kind of sunshine are we talking about? For someone who lives in the desert areas of Egypt or Afghanistan, sunshine could be a very bad thing. It's brutally hot all the time in the desert. For someone who lives around the Mojave, you are my sunshine might not be a good thing. But for someone who lives in Santa Barbara, California, you are my sunshine is probably pretty pleasant. Treading water. Treading water is a metaphor, right? Treading water could mean one thing to one person and another thing to another. What if I don't know how to swim? 
Treading water is not a good and pleasant memory. Raining cats and dogs. I just threw this one in there just because it's just, I, every time I hear that phrase, I literally think of cats and dogs falling from the sky. But that's not what it means. It means however it came to pass, it means that it's pouring down rain. I don't know how cats and dogs falling from the sky eventually evolved into this metaphor we use today. But it's one of them. And you can even find metaphors inside of metaphors. And that gets really fun. And it's a, it's a fun journey to, to uh, go down. And here we go with metaphors about journeys. But it's fun to go down that path and, and discover these different literary usages. When it comes to the Bible, we have some big picture metaphors that are used, right? Stormy seas are used across the Bible. We've talked about the stormy seas or the waters, the the creatures of the ocean that are uh, related as chaos. Trees as people, right? We have the verse where the, um, the blind man is healed, and before he's fully healed, it, Jesus asks him, he says, what do you see? And he says, I see, I see men as trees walking, right? But even more than that, Israel is related as if it's a olive tree. Well, the nation of Israel is not literally an olive tree, Daniel Binkley. The olive tree is, a, is used to show a certain picture of what God's nation is supposed to be. One of the most often used metaphors in the Bible, probably the most often used metaphor, if I remember correctly, is God's marriage to Israel. I would say it's often uh, the most missed, misused metaphor in the Bible. Does God literally marry His people? No, there's no like literal marriage ceremony. He's relating uh, his relationship to us, to his covenant people, in a way that we can understand. That's how he uses marriage as a metaphor. We'll go through a few of them here in the Bible. These are just some of my favorites. Proverbs 13, a wise person's instruction is a fountain of life. If Seth has given me all his wisdom and it would take years to give it to me, can I see that as a fountain of life? Something that doesn't cease to flow. This is the idea we're getting about God's uh, wisdom. And the wisdom that comes from God is wisdom that does not cease to flow. We think of this fountain of life that allows you to live forever, but turning away from the snares of death. Does death literally have traps? Like if I turn around, has death set a literal trap behind me? No, this whole verse right here is giving this beautiful picture of running towards the water that brings life and away from these traps that would ensnare us into death. Isaiah 64, this is one that uh, we love. You are our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter. We all are the work of your hands. There's so much going on here. It's calling us back to the creation narrative where water and, and dirt seemingly were put together to form us into an an, an object, an inanimate object, and we were later animated. But it's using this potter language to show us that God can form us. And we think about a potter, you know, the way they do pottery today is very old. It's not like they came up with a potter's wheel yesterday and this is a new technology, right? They've been using a potter's wheel for many thousands of years. And what do you do whenever you go and you try to make something on a potter's wheel the changes are gradual and slow. Try to make a quick change on a potter's wheel and you'll find yourself with a heap of mess that you've got to clean up and start all over. This metaphor of us as clay and God as the potter gives us this image of being changed slowly and how much does our perspective differ so much from God's, especially when this comes. We have people that come, either come to Yeshua or they come to the knowledge of a deeper walk with Yeshua and we have this expectation that they conform to how God wants them to live immediately overnight but God says you're clay and I'm a potter I will mold you in my time I will take the time to make sure that you are intricately designed and that you are conformed into my image in the way and the manner in which I choose the Lord is my shepherd. This is one of the most famous metaphors. God is not literally a shepherd, right? We don't walk around and find God, oh, there's God. He's over there tending his sheep. Let's go get his attention. No, he 
presents himself as a shepherd to a people at the time who well knew what shepherding meant. We've kind of lost that concept and the idea of a shepherd these days because not too many of us realize what animal husbandry is or what it means to raise our own livestock. I was listening to um, a woman speak about disabilities in the church uh, the other day, and, and she was saying how a lot of churches have no, um, have no accommodations for handicapped people. And she was saying how, you know, she, she was going around and talking to church. She's a, a handicapped person herself. Going around talking to churches about the accessibility for handicapped people, and she came to this church. It was actually the church her uh, son went to preschool at. They redid the whole church. They added a coffee shop and all these hip things that churches do, and they added TV screens. And it was a two-story church, and they didn't add an elevator. And she said, why did you not add an elevator? And they said, well, we've only had one person that's come to our church handicapped, so we didn't see the need to add all that money for an elevator for one person whenever all these other people benefit from what we spend money on elsewhere. Those people had lost the concept that God gives us of, of him as a shepherd because Jesus is going to come and then he relates this story where he leaves the what? 99 and goes after the one. Goes after the one. Even that one is worthy of our service to them. That church had lost the concept of Psalm 23, verse 1. Never mind going into Jesus' words where he clearly and explicitly states that he would leave the 99 for the 1. They lost the concept of this metaphor. I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. If I ask my seven-year-old to interpret this verse, how is Jesus bread? I'm not saying she couldn't come to understand the verse without some explanation, but this metaphor of Jesus as bread and all those who come won't be hungry. Are people literally never going to hunger again? No, 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 no. He's saying you won't hunger for those spiritual things that you hunger for. I am the light of the world. Did Jesus walk around literally glowing this light? Was he a big beacon? No, no, no. He says this in John 8, as he's sitting in the court of the women underneath four 50-foot candlesticks that lit up the entire city of Jerusalem during the, the Feast of Sukkot. He's using a metaphor here to call the people's mind of who he's speaking to the, the very thing that they saw every night. It's like saying we had a light big enough in, in Monroe, West Monroe, that during Sukkot, it would be so bright that it would look like daylight outside. Josephus uh, uh, refers to these lights and says that there wasn't a single courtyard in Jerusalem that wasn't touched at night. It would be like going outside and seeing daylight. Think of like Alaska where the time zones and the way that earth tilts and all that stuff is different and they have daylight at midnight. This is what he's trying to convey. Luke 20 says, But he looked at them, then what is the meaning of the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's using a metaphor again. One of my favorite ones is the metaphor 11, and this really starts to conceptualize how metaphors can be used in different ways. Just last week, someone asked me, what does the number three mean in the scripture? Like 10 years ago, I'd have been like, it means the completeness of God. Like, as much as we say that, uh, as much as my, my mindset on the simplicity of the Bible has changed, so has my mindset on these different definitions within the Bible. The number three, I used to would say, just that simple definition. Then that person would go on, and they would try to apply this completeness of God and every time they saw the number three in the scripture, except for we have people being uh, in trouble with, with relation to the number three. And we have all these other things that, that don't seem to apply. So I went on this 10 minute discussion with this guy about the number three and what it meant in all the different ways. 
It's kind of like the law of first mention. Ever, anybody ever heard of that? The law of first mention. It's this old biblical concept that's not really a good one that says the first time we hear a word in the Bible, that meaning is what it means for the rest of the Bible. That's absolutely not true. That absolutely will lead you into a bad place. We don't even have that concept in our own language. Words just 50 years ago in English mean something totally and completely different today. It's no different with the Hebrew language, with the Greek language. Words that meant something at the time of Moses meant something different at the time of Ezekiel. So metaphors are no different. Metaphors can mean one thing. They can mean something else. When we look in Exodus, we look at the, the, the starting point for leaven in the Scriptures. It says the people baked the dough they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened loaves since they had no yeast. This concept of leaven is a literal... You're welcome, Daniel. This concept of leaven is literal when it's first given, right? The, the bread literally had no leaven and it couldn't rise. It literally was not leavened and it couldn't rise. This was a literal thing that happened. They left Egypt too fast. They had no leaven. We jump forward to the New Testament, Galatians 5. You were running well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you the disciple why didn't it put well the very next verse is what was supposed to be on there verse 9 uh, a little leaven leavens a whole lump right we all know that verse and it's quoted so often and here where that verse comes from it's related to this binding this this oppressive theology that people were being persuaded to that said you had to earn your salvation that it wasn't a free gift, that you had to jump through loopholes that man had created to be able to draw near to God. It's not a very good picture of leaven, right? In our own conception of leaven during Passover, we relate leaven to sin, something that's really not that attested to in the Scripture that much, but um, we, had, we relate it to sin and getting that sin out of our lives. Again, not a very good conception of leaven. Mark 8 says the disciples had forgotten to take bread. They're getting in this boat and they only had one loaf with them. Then he gave them strict orders. Watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Jesus uses this, this moment where they only brought one loaf on the boat. It seems really strange and out of place. Oh, you only have one loaf? Be careful. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Wait a minute. What just happened? He's using the opportunity to share a theological purpose and a theological message. That the leaven of the Pharisees, that what was just in Galatians, that leaven, this concept of theology that oppresses people and makes it where they cannot draw close to God, it can spread like wildfire. And he says, be careful of that. Don't let it spread. Matthew 13 says, He told them another parable. It's like the shortest parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed in 50 pounds of flour until it was all leaven. Well, wait a minute. Hold up. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, but the Pharisees are like leaven? And Herod. Herod is like leaven? Now, the metaphors don't have to be used the same way every time. This concept of puffing up or spreading out or, or moving and spreading and growing larger, that metaphor can be used good or bad. It can be used in many different ways. So we have to be careful when we, when we read the scriptures that we're reading metaphors and we're reading these, these uh, poetic associations in ways that do justice to the passage they're coming from. One of my favorite metaphors is the rock metaphor, and this kind of leads us into uh, the mountain metaphors because what is a mountain but a big old giant rock, right? So rock metaphors are used throughout scriptures. My favorite one here is in 1 Corinthians 10. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea. And there's so many metaphors right here. We're just going to deal with one, but um, all were baptized into Moses. I'm like, wait a minute. Moses is not a literal body of water, right? In the cloud and in the sea, they all ate the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank 
from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's a beautiful passage, but it draws this question, and this question is not one that we have today that's new to us. This is an ancient question. What was this rock that it's referring to? How is Jesus this rock that followed them through the wilderness? Was Jesus a little rock? No, not at all. What does this mean? And there's so many different uh, conceptions of what it was. There's the ancient Jewish Haggadah, which is the Passover book that leads us through the service that references this this rock that comes through. People have said, well, see, that's, that's kind of referencing what, what we're talking about. The wisdom of Solomon mentions a well that was in the wilderness. That could be what it's talking about. This concept of Miriam's well, Mary's well, this is, gets even deeper where they associate the time that the water cut off to the death of Mary, uh, Miriam. So it must have been Miriam's well, this hyper-spiritual rock that they literally rolled and pushed with them. No, I don't think so, because it said that rock followed them, right? So I don't think we're quite there yet. My favorite and where I think that, that I'll land on this is Deuteronomy 32. One of the most heavy associations to a rock in relation to God in the entire Scriptures, Deuteronomy 32. And there's so much there in that chapter but it's used uh, there as, as a metaphor for God. Verse 4 says, The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God without bias. He is righteous and true. God is our rock. And there's so much ingrained within that. Now, we think about rocks today, and we can move rocks. We have this building that we're in that's literally made out of a bunch of rocks. I mean... That's what bricks are, right? It's essentially rocks. Concrete is literally rocks and plaster together with water. We live in, a, in, a, in an age where technology says we can go and literally blow up mountains and, and remove them. We can just take out big gaps out of a mountain, put a road right through it, and we're good to go. But what day was this written in? This was written in a day where you couldn't do that. When God is presented as a rock to us, it's the immovable. It's the one thing that can't be touched in a way that any, every, everything else can. You can't move this huge stone. God is our rock is 78 times mentioned in the Psalms. And when we think about those stormy seas of chaos... We think about how those waves crash and, and the waters flow. That's very scary to a person in a boat, right? But how scary is it to someone standing on a rocky shore and watching that water be stopped by a rocky cliff? Those chaos waters cannot penetrate the rock. There's so many, never mind. Deuteronomy 32, 18, as you go down through the scriptures, it relates how Israel was in the wilderness because he was their rock and their strength, the source that they were supposed to rely on, the foundation of their faith, the, the one they could lean on and nothing could be changed. But he says, you ignored the rock who gave you birth. You forgot the God who gave birth to you. My opinion, when Paul mentions the rock in 1 Corinthians, he's specifically resorting back to and referring back to Deuteronomy 32, a very well-known passage in the Torah at that time, even for those who couldn't read. He's referring back to these rock passages, and there's more in the chapter. And he's saying, this rock, this one that followed you, he led you by a flame and he led you by a cloud of smoke but this rock followed you, and this rock protected you, and this rock brought out water for you, that rock was Yeshua. That's who it was. When we think about rocks as metaphors, we're left to big rocks, these, these mountains. And there's so many more that we could go through in the Scriptures of, of metaphors and what they mean in the Scripture and, and how they're highlighting something so much deeper than what is on the surface, but I want to talk about mountains as metaphors. Psalm 3, this is a, a short psalm. It's David. It says at the beginning of the psalm that he's fleeing for his life from Absalom, and he pauses after verse 2. Verse 1 and 2, he basically says, I'm fleeing for my life. God, these enemies are coming after me. He pauses. Selah. Selah. 
a pause, a moment of worship. He stops in the midst of his fear. He stops in the midst of his anxiety about what's coming against him. He pauses in the midst of those things that seem to be in our own physical eyes, the worst things, someone wanting to kill me. And he says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory. And the one who lifts up my head, I cry out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. Now, if we take this just completely literally, God is not sitting on a mountain somewhere, and, and, and David just happens to pass by that mountain, and he calls out to God at that moment, Oh, there you are, God, up on the mountain. Hey, I need you to come. No. What is he trying to relay here poetically when he uses mountain as a metaphor? The mountain is the place where God dwells. Why is it the place where God dwells? And this just isn't a metaphor that's used in the Bible. It's a metaphor that's used for other religions of that time. Why was that the place where God's dwelt? I know for me in Louisiana, like growing up, the biggest mountains I saw early on were like the Ozarks, which are kind of like big hills, right? They're pretty green and people live on top of those, no problem. But that's not what they saw in Israel. Go to Israel and see the big mountains that they lived on or see the big mountains that were around them. These were big, huge rocks that had no vegetation, especially in a desert, arid area. These were the places where only God could dwell. These were the places where man could not sustain life forever. These were the places where you must depend on God if you go there. And God brings his people to a mountain, this place in the desert, Nexus 19, and he calls one person up onto the mountain. And it's God who sustains him for 40 days, and he comes down for a day. And then 40 more days, and he comes down for a day. And then 40 more days, and he comes down for a day. God sustained Moses on the mountain for 120 days without bread or water. The mountains are the place where God dwells. The very first mountain that we have, well, we'll get there in a minute. More specifically, the mountain is the place where you can see from God's perspective. Think of Moses up on the mountain looking down on the nation of Israel. In that moment, he sees from God's perspective. He's looking down on God's nation. And at one point, he speaks from there and he says, God, those people, those are your people. You deal with those people. The mountain is the place where we can see from God's perspective. The first mountain we have is in Genesis 2. It's the Garden of Eden itself. All the river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there, it divided and became the source of four rivers. If four rivers are flowing from a central location, what is that location but the highest point, right? Four different rivers flowing from one place. It's the highest point. This concept, later on in the scriptures, I should have put the other verse. It actually literally calls Eden the mountain. I think it's Ezekiel. This place where the waters flow from. God's Eden, his garden was seen as this mountaintop. This place, this high place where he could dwell. And when we think about it, we go back to the Tower of Babel. And these people built this tower so that they could be what? Like God. In the high place, in the lofty place. It's the place if we view God in the heavens, if we view him as being up in the lofty heavens, it's the place where we on earth could be closest to him, at least in the concepts of our minds. Genesis 13, the story of Lot. And I love this story where God brings them to the place where he said he's going to dwell. He brings them to Canaan, this place, this promised land that God's going to give to Abraham's descendants. And they kind of have a falling out. Right? Abram and Lot decide we cannot dwell together. There's no way we can be alone. I mean, we, we cannot dwell uh, alone together. We must separate here. And he gives Lot the first choice. And what does Lot choose? He chooses the valley area. He sees with his own eyes. He looks through his own perspective and says, that area is luscious and green. And it it's, looks like I can live and sustain life. I'm going to choose that area. And we know where it leads Lot, right? But when he chooses that area, where is Abram left? But in the mountains, in the hills, Harim. 
He's left the, the higher places, and God tells him, look up. He says, look from the place where you are. Look to the north, the south, the east, and the west, for I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. Could Abram see the entire nation of Israel from that point? No. God's telling Abram to look up so that he can see from his perspective. My opinion, God supernaturally showed Abram not only all of the land of Israel that would be the promise to his descendants, but he showed Abram the fullness of the history that would come after him, the fullness of his seed that would go forth and bless the nations. Later on, after Lot finds himself in trouble, because he moves to this valley, and he moves outside the borders of Sodom. And then a little while later, we see that he's now found himself near the city of Sodom. Then we find him in the city of Sodom. And then lo and behold, he's sitting at the gate of the city of Sodom. He has fully ingrained himself into this city that's meant to show us the difference between where he chose and where Abram chose. And God goes through this whole story and he, he, he destroys Lot and, and, and uh, excuse me, destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot is leaving. And it says in Genesis 19, as soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you'll be swept away. I highlighted mountains here. Interesting perspective. That word is actually singular. He tells Lot to run to the mountain. Run towards God. Run towards the place where faith is established. Run back to Abram, the place that you chose to separate from yourself. Run to the mountain. Run back to the mountaintop where God can sustain your life. We actually see that Lot chooses not to do that. And it doesn't bode well for him. Exodus 19 says, Moses went up the mountain to God and the Lord called him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. God calls Moses up to the mountain, singular. And God gives him his perspective. The words that Moses is going to bring down from the mountain to the people of Israel is not his words, but God's words. And all too often today we confuse the law of Moses as being Moses' law when it's the law of God given through Moses. Moses is brought to the mountaintop so that he can see through God's eyes what his desire was for his nation and then bring that view back to God's people. At the end of Moses' life, in Deuteronomy 34, Moses goes up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah which faces Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land. Again, do we think that Moses could literally see all the land of Israel from this point? No. He could not see from Gilead to Dan. There's no point on that side of Israel where anyone can see from Gilead to Dan. All of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, it's simply not possible. The Negev, the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zor, the Lord then said to them, him, This is the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross into it. I have let you see it with your own eyes. God gave his view to Moses in that moment. My opinion, I believe that what he did with Abram is the same thing he does with Moses. He gives him his perspective. He allows him to see not just the entire land of Israel from a place that he literally couldn't see it, but he lets him see the fruit of all of his labors that would culminate in Yeshua, blessing the nations. He lets him see even us today sitting here in Monroe, Louisiana, coming together to worship Him, and then going out into our places throughout the week and being a light to the nations. Just my opinion, the text doesn't clearly state that. But we know He literally can't see the things that it's saying He saw, so something deeper is being said here. In Numbers, when uh, Moses sends them out, and God tells Moses to send them out, Moses sends them out to scout the land of Canaan. He told them, 
Go up this way to the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. And there's, I've highlighted this hill country. What is that idea when we see hill country? We're thinking, uh, me personally, I think hill country of Texas. Like this vast land of rolling hills. It's not a very specific place to tell them to go. Again, that word is singular, har. Tell them to go up into the mountain. Tell them to go into the land and go up on a mountain. This is not just a military strategy where they can see things from a top-down perspective, my opinion. He's asking them to go into the land and see what he wants them to see. He's promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, and he's promised them that he would go before them and conquer their enemies. So he wants them to go into the land and go to the mountain, go to the top and see the perspective of what God sees. Go see your enemies, your future enemies. When I bring you in this land, I want you to see them as I see them, as mere ants. Or as the text puts it for themselves later on, as mere grasshoppers. Just bugs. But what do they come back with? The text very specifically never tells you they ever go to a mountain. But it very specifically tells you they go to a valley. And what was their perspective if I go to a valley and I'm not seeing from God's perspective? If I'm not literally on top of the mountain and I'm not literally looking down at my enemies and then I'm not spiritually seeing what God has for me to see. I'm not looking through the lens that God has told me to look through. I will see myself as those ants or those grasshoppers as opposed to seeing my enemies as such. And the phrase they use is very unique. It says, we were as grasshoppers. And surely they saw us as such. I had to slow down on that verse this week because really blowing through that verse in the past, I used to think, yeah, they, we were like grasshoppers to them. That's kind of how I've, I've put it. Like Israel saw them. Yeah, yep, we were grasshoppers to them. No, no, no. If you slow down, they first say we were as grasshoppers and surely they saw us as such. It was first their perspective and their view of themselves that was distorted. And then their view of their enemies was then distorted after that. God said that he would go out before them and he would destroy their enemies. Who are they to say what God has put into their vision of who God's people were? How many times do we do the same thing? Surely I can't be used by God for anything good. Surely God could never use someone like me to go out and expand his kingdom. Surely God could never use me to go out and defeat the enemies and the spiritual powers of darkness. Who told you that that was their perspective of you? We have taken God out of the situation when we let that perspective creep in. We get to the New Testament. Jesus was led up by the Spirit, into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil. Matthew, I believe, is presenting Jesus as the new Moses. And him going into this wilderness experience in Matthew 4 is showing what truly Israel was supposed to do. Have no fear and go out. But he goes there, and where does he bring him? He says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. We've all said it many, many times before that the enemy is an imitator, right? He doesn't create and he has no good ideas of his own. He just imitates God and wants to be like him. It's the very thing that the serpent tells that, that disputes them. Surely you won't die and you will be like God. That's his thing. He brings him up to this high mountain hoping to show him this perspective and say, here, this is a place where you can be like God. And he shows him all the kingdom and the world of splendor. But what does Yeshua do? He doesn't. He sees through the lens that God wants him to see through. And he's not tempted to the point of break and sin. And what's the very next chapter? What is the very next chapter that follows this mountaintop experience where he overcomes temptation from the enemy, but the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, 1, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. 
I think reading that in the past, I've literally thought about, like I have some hills on my property. And I've literally, like if you look out my back door, my, my yard goes down and it comes up to this hill. I think I've almost thought of this as if Jesus took these people and like sat across over on this hill, you know. Like he's just over here in this field of green and flowers and like sitting down on this rolling grassy knoll. I don't think that's what the text wants you to understand. I think that the writer of Matthew wants you to see as if he brought those disciples on top of Mount Sinai. As if he brought all of those people up to the place where God dwells. He brought all those people into the presence of God where they could be sustained by the bread of life that he's about to give them. It uses the word mountain for a reason. This is not a rolling hill that it wants you to understand, but the place where only God dwells. And what does he give you? What does he teach them after he gets up there? Later on, he's going to teach them the real, true perspective of what was told on Mount Sinai. Here's what I really meant when I said, don't hate your brother. Here's what I really meant when I gave this, this option for divorce. Here's what I really meant in all these other situations that were spoken to you by Moses before. But what comes before that? The Beatitudes, right? And you want to talk about God's perspective versus man. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What man or woman in their right mind on earth would say that a person who's poor in spirit is blessed? None. Blessed are those who mourn. Anybody here lost a loved one? Have you ever thought that I was immensely blessed in my mourning over that lost loved one? From man's perspective, that seems illogical and almost crazy. Blessed are those who are persecuted. It says persecuted for my name's sake. But when we think about persecution, who in their right mind in this world would ever say that the persecuted people are blessed? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. You know, the world says that those who hunger and thirst are the least blessed. But Jesus brings them on this mountain and he says these things because... These are God's perspectives, not man's. He's showing and teaching what God sees versus what man sees. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Seeing beyond our personal selves and our own selfish desires and our own needs, our own physical limitations. Seeing beyond what we think we need or deserve or have or should have. Seeing beyond that and seeing what our service and our commitment to God's kingdom does for future generations. Being able to see that my humility and mourning or being poor in spirit affects generations that I'll never know. Being able to see that when I'm persecuted for his name's sake, there's someone 50 years from now that will benefit. Being able to see that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for his righteousness. That a hundred years from now, another Will Ham will be blessed and will enter the kingdom because he hungered and thirsted for righteousness right now. That's the perspective that God wants you to see. That's the perspective that God showed Moses. Look, dude, you're not going to enter the land. You just spent 40 years wandering with these knuckleheads and going through all this trouble. You're not fisting to inherit the physical promises, but let me show you what all of your work and faithfulness has done. There are generations that you will never see that your humble service to my kingdom has benefited. Seeing through God's perspective is understanding that you may never benefit physically in this world from the service that you commit to his kingdom. Revelation 21 says, He then carried me away to, in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. This concept of where God dwells. Yeshua come. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. 
But when God's kingdom comes in fullness at the end of the age, if that's what we think this passage is literally saying, it's as if God brings his entire mountaintop down to man and says, now everyone dwells with me. Everyone dwells on the same level as me. Isaiah 2 has an interesting perspective of the mountaintop that I want to point out. The vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths, for instruction will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Isaiah takes this concept of a mountain and he says in the end of days when God's fullness has come, when, when truly his purpose for Israel is complete, his mountain will be established on the top of the mountains. His house will be there and all the nations will stream to it. All the nations will come and, and they'll say, come, let us go up to the mountain. And what a difference there is between Isaiah 2 and Exodus 19. Keep reading in Isaiah. He will settle disputes among the nations and provide arbitration for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plows and their spears will uh, into pruning knives. Nation will not take up the sword against nation and they will never again train for war. Complete peace. Complete peace. All the nations will be streaming. This isn't just like, hey, let's go up here every once in a while. God says that his mountain, his house on a mountain will be full because the nations are just flowing into it. They can't stay away. And what is the difference between Exodus 20 and Isaiah 2? Exodus 20, they come to Mount Sinai. We're talking about two different mountains here, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. Exodus 20, they said, don't let God speak to us. One man, please go up and tell us what he says. But in Isaiah 2, they all say, let us go up. Not let us go us, but let us go up. Typo. They all say, let us go up. We have this idea, this concept and it's not to say that there's anything wrong with Mount Sinai. That was an experience where God blessed his nation with the gift of ten words. I was talking about that this week. So many times, if you use the number ten, and we're talking about metaphors and numerology again, but the number ten, there's so many times where ten gifts, you look at uh, the servant going to find Isaac, a bride, he brings ten camels. You look at um, several instances, I can't remember off the top of my head, ten loaves are given twice, and uh, ten oxen are given. Ten talents of silver are given. God gave ten words. This was a covenant gift to his people. So Mount Sinai is good, but when they get to the land, the fullness of what, what God intended, because God didn't intend for Israel to sit and camp around Mount Sinai in the desert. He intended them to get his understanding, his instruction, and move forward to the promise. When they get to the promise and his, his throne is established... He says it's everybody would want to draw near. And this is what Yeshua has brought to us, this, this concept of the mountaintop experience brought low. Isaiah later on says that whenever the enemies of, of God's people come, he says, I will, sh I will shorten the mountains and I will raise up the valleys. Can God literally do that? Sure. Is that what Isaiah, Isaiah intended? No. He says, I will come down to you and I will bring you up to my level and we will walk the highway together. I will lead my people. And he did just that. Yeshua came and he tabernacled. He dwelt amongst us. He humbled himself. He brought himself to a place where he could see from our perspective and then he showed us his. He brought us to a place where he could say, I understand the pains and the, and the suffering that you're going through, but let me show you what that equals. A kingdom that will expand like leaven. There's this concept that we use in churches today that says that you'll have these mountaintop experiences. Anybody ever heard that before? Um, I hear it often and I often cringe nowadays because it, it goes kind of like this. Like, hey, when you come to, to, to Yeshua, when, we, when you come to Christ, 
You gotta have these mountaintop experiences. What they're referring to is this emotional high that you get from coming to God. But know that there's gonna be valleys and don't get discouraged and just try to make it through the valley to the next mountaintop experience. And uh, people mean well and they're trying to encourage people. I don't wanna disparage the people that are using this metaphor because that's what it is. I don't wanna discourage the metaphor, but that's not what God intended. God didn't intend for us to go through mountains and valleys in our life with him. God doesn't say that we're not going to have mountains and valleys in our personal life. But God didn't intend for us to have spiritual highs and then spiritual lows. God didn't intend for us to go up and down on this roller coaster of life with him spiritually. Ephesians 2 says, In him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. God calls you the temple of God. And he says that his spirit wants to dwell within you. So if God wants you to be the temple of God and his spirit to dwell within you, is there any point where God says, yeah, I expect you to have a spiritual low? And No, no, no. <laughs> when we come to God, when we come to Christ, when we come to faith in Yeshua, God wants us to forever see through his perspective. Do we literally need to go to a mountaintop? Absolutely not. But God gave us his word so that we could see the world around us through his perspective, a blessing that most of Israel for the entire history of God's people never had. Nobody ever had this past like 10 years ago where I could flip through his word so easily. I can search, I can like highlight things and look up Hebrew words like on a whim. I've got an entire library built into this tablet with over 3,000 books and resources. We live in a world that is so blessed to have God's word at our fingertips, but sometimes I think to have so much at our fingertips to be, at fingertips to be able to see through God's eyes, we see through it less than ever before. How selfish of a people are we? When we view the world around us and we say, I deserve that, I need that, I should be placed here, or I should be doing this, or I should be led here, that was my perspective that I was shown was wrong this week. I text Seth yesterday and I text a picture from uh, my new office. I got a new office on ULM's campus, and uh, I, I texted him because I had no idea that he moved to ULM. I was telling Nate this story about how um, God would, moved this week in me to show me that my perspective was not his. I had some issues at work. I think I shared them here before. And I said, I think I need to go over here. This job was coming opening. Um, there's no way I put in for this trans transfer. Everybody, the, the receiving unit, the losing unit, everybody says, hey, you're the guy. There's nobody else that can come close to meeting where you are on paper. You're, you're above, you know, head and shoulders above everybody. You will get this job. You'll get this transfer. Well, guess what? I didn't get the transfer. Over a technicality within the system, I didn't get the transfer. And I was so bummed out. I said, what in the world? I had all my hopes from my perspective, this was what I thought I needed for my life to move forward in a right way. And just this week, God showed me through the opening of multiple doors that that wasn't my perspective. I had something else that I viewed your situation from. You got so entrenched in what you thought you needed or what you thought you deserved that you failed to even come and join me on my mountain and see what I thought you needed and what I thought you deserved. You failed to come join me on my mountain and look down on the situation from my perspective. You chose to go to the valley and look up and say, what a horrible situation I've been in. What, why did I, did I get placed here? Why did I deserve this? And God humbled me through the experience but I wasn't mad about it because in the end I see God's faithfulness and his mercy and I see his providence that shows me a path where God can interact with me more and God can use me more to interact with others. Who cares about what I think I need or deserve? What does God think I need? 
If I continue to go to the valleys and I see myself as a grasshopper, then sure, the world will squash me. But if I obey God and I go to the mountaintop and I see the world around me from His perspective, that fear and that anxiety and that bitterness, that offense, because I was offended, right? I just had to eat my own words from a few weeks ago when I preached about offense. All those things are meaningless. When I go to the mountaintop and I see blessed are those who hunger and thirst. How much more blessed can I say that I am right now? Remember, if anything, that God's dwell, dwelling spirit wants to dwell within you. That he wants you to see through his perspective. That he wants you to join him on his mountain. That he has lowered his mountain and raised the valley so that you can walk side by side with God. He humbled himself, brought himself to this world, and he walked amongst us to show us what it means to walk in God's humility and what it means to walk seeing the world around him through God's perspective. That's one of the biggest points of Yeshua's message in the Gospels. He gave us the example of walking as he walked. If I think I deserve that transfer, that position, how much more am I saying that I didn't deserve to go to the cross like Jesus did? Like, that's crazy. I think I deserve that one little thing. No, 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 I really deserve that. I really deserve a gruesome death. Remember that God wants you to see through His eyes and His perspectives. Pray daily to join Him on His mountain and see the world around you for, through the lens that He wants you to see. Not dwelling on yourself, but dwelling on His kingdom purpose. Patiently waiting for Him to interact with your life, even if it goes beyond what you will ever see in your lifetime here on earth. Father, we bless you. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for this community of believers, this community that comes together for your purpose, for your, for your divine will. Lead us and direct us into being lights in this world. Give us eyes to see your perspective. Let us see how we are to interact with the world around us. Let us see through what you see so that we can follow you appropriately. Let us shuck off all selfishness, all considerations of our own personal good and what we think is best for us, and let us solely focus on what you have for us, both as individuals and as a community. Lead us, guide us, direct our steps so that we can walk on the high places, so that we can see the world around us, the, the enemies that want to come against us spiritually, we can see them as mere grasshoppers. And that we'll have the faith and the confidence and the boldness to walk forward side by side with you, our rock, our armor bearer, our shield, our strength, the one who is able to heal, the one who is able to provide. We love you. We bless you. We give you thanks for all that you have done for us. Amen. Before any kind of questions and answers or anything, comments, for anybody that's like looking for um, a deeper study on the different, different images of our imagery that's used in the Bible, this book, Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, it's like 50 bucks, but it's like this huge book. And it's super good to go through the scriptures and say, hey, look up mountain and see what it has to say. And it just goes through all the scriptures, the way mountains are used, the way uh, tents are used, the way shoes are used. It's a really good resource. So anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, complaints? All right. Shabbat shalom.